Hello, I'm John Walters. I'm president of Hudson Institute. Um, we are very pleased and honored to be joined by uh, a series of experts from around the world who are going to talk about uh, the origins of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, what we know about them in this, this area, and, and something about what this uh, terrible plague um, means for the future of the world and for um, the future of policy and uh, our interactions with uh, uh, each other and with uh, uh, communist China. Um, uh, we're joined today by Senator James Patterson. He's Senator of Victoria, Aust Australia, Deputy Chair of the Select Committee on COVID-19 and Chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security. We're also joined by a member of parliament from Tombridge and Malling in the United Kingdom, Tom Tugendhat. He is chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee in, uh, in the UK. And David Asher, my colleague and senior fellow here at the Hudson Institute, who has been advisor to the US government and held a number of positions uh, uh, in the government in the past. He's been working on the COVID origins issue here in Washington, DC. I guess, uh, as a, as a beginning point, um, I wonder, given where we are in the pandemic and the investigation into the pandemic, uh, what each of you would like to uh, tell us about as an opening point of uh, where we are and where we're going. And I guess I'll, I'll start with, uh, with Senator Patterson. John, thank you so much for the invitation to join you and your colleagues at the Hudson Institute. I am a big admirer of the very important work you do and the outstanding fellows and researchers that you employ and the really leading role that you play in public debate in the United States and around the world, and particularly on such big geostrategic questions like the future of all of our relationship with China and the behaviour of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, by way of opening remarks, I think it's really important that we remember that what we are all asking for, that we all expect, what we all want, is nothing controversial and nothing reasonable at all. If there is ever a global pandemic, no matter where it emanates in the world, no matter what circumstances under which it arises, it is an entirely reasonable and justified thing to want to understand why and where and how it emerged and how it was handled by whichever host government under whose watch it emerged. And we sometimes lose sight of that in this debate. It has been made controversial when it should not be. The only thing that's controversial about the origins of this virus is it happened to happen on the watch of the Chinese Communist Party, and they are highly sensitive to criticism, scrutiny, and the disinfectant that comes with transparency and light. And so we should all be confident in asserting on behalf of all of the people of the world uh, that the Chinese government has an obligation to be open and transparent about what happened and how. And until we have those answers, we need to all continue to demand them and forthrightly. Thank you. Um, uh, Tom Tugendhat, uh, I, I guess I'll, I'll turn to you. Uh, uh, thank you again for joining us as well. Uh, could you give us uh, what you're seeing in the UK? Of course, look, I think, I mean, I, I couldn't put a cigarette paper between what James said and, and what I believe. I mean, he's absolutely right. This is a fundamental right of every human in the world to have an understanding of what caused this virus for the very simple reason that we all need to prepare our defences against us, against it. And what we're seeing around the world is one of the greatest moments of uh, global cooperation in terms of some of the vaccine work that we've been doing and some of the uh, health prevention work that we've been doing, but it's also one of the greatest moments of threat. So we are seeing in the UK today uh, a whole society that's coming out of two years of real trauma. And it's not just people who've been affected by COVID in a direct sense, as in they've been hospitalized or sadly died, but it's an entire society that has effectively been forced to live under conditions that many of us as free people thought we would never ask our fellow citizens to have to endure. I know that uh, all of us are uh, fundamentally, uh, you know, advocates of freedom, personal freedom, as well as international freedom. Uh, and so these situations that have arisen have really troubled us all. And I think that the point that I'd like to add to James is, is what this has exposed is not just the intertwined nature uh, that we all have and the danger therefore that the uh, dictatorships of the world pose to free peoples, not in a necessarily an aggressive sense, but simply in the culture that they emanate at home and the way that they're able to or encourage secrecy and self-deceit 
uh, let alone international deceit, but also the failures of the international system that we have built up since the 1950s, 1960s, and that we now need to look at really hard to see how it is updated. Now, personally, I was critical of the uh, last president's decision, last president of the United States decision to withdraw from the World Health Organization. But I did understand it, and I understood it because, sadly, that organization has struggled. Uh, various understandable reasons why it has. I'm not going to be pointing fingers particularly aggressively, but it has struggled badly uh, in the COVID uh, experience. And we need to look really hard at how we make sure that our international organizations work for us in the future uh, and don't uh, assist with the cover-ups that some regimes seek. Thank you. Uh, David Asher. Well, I just want to concur with our distinguished guests uh, and uh, representatives of their respective legislative bodies uh, and, and their uh, esteemed assessment because the um, situation really is uh, intolerable, uh, intolerable and uh, unacceptable, I should say. I mean, we are in a uh, position as global governments and partners and allies of the closest uh, type where we really don't have a cognitive understanding among our people, among our leadership, among our intelligence agencies as to what happened in Wuhan and why, and why most importantly things were covered up. Uh, I, I believe a cover up is worse than a crime. It's, you know, although in the US law cover up is a crime, it's a conspiracy. And we don't really know what's motivated this. We, uh, I've dealt with China for 35 years. I think the two of you have dealt with China for most, of, much of your lives as well. And we don't foster, uh, uh, we don't, we, we're not foster a hostility toward toward the Chinese people. Uh, I, the Chinese government's actions are almost inexplicable in my experience, having gone through SARS with them and other uh, situations, including the EP3 incident where our, our one of our intelligence aircraft was shot, that was basically not shot down, it was brought down by a collision with a Chinese fighter aircraft. We didn't have communications for 14 days. Well, we haven't had communications really with the Chinese government for the US government in like uh, 21 months that are really substantive. Uh, no one has talked about COVID that I'm aware of, including uh, Secretary Blinken in this recent uh, uh, the communications and, and, the, and President Biden even. I don't know if they even mentioned it. Uh, maybe they did. But it's a it's a problem. The silence is not cold in this situation. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, I'd like to start uh, in trying to see whether we can get um, from your experience and very and around the world, and your experience dealing with the uh, the uh, question of the origins of this a little greater clarity than we've had in Washington with the. Uh, uh, our intelligence community laboring very hard and then saying, well, we have different views and uh, we don't have a clear um, um, set of conclusions. Um, I, I would ask each of you, what, what are the three things that you think we know about the origins of COVID? And given what we know, what are the couple of most important things that we could reasonably conclude? I want to see if we can get a little more clarity than our, the entire massive apparatus of the United States and its allies intelligence community, because as these things become political, you all know, they, they it's not about what we see, it's about what it's permissible to say. So uh, we have freedom here in the little confides of this of this event. Uh, I, I wonder what, uh, uh, what you think are the most important things we know and what we can, most important things we can reasonably infer. Um, why don't I start with uh, 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 Mr. Tugendhat? Sure, look, I think there's a, there's a few things we know. One is that, there was an outbreak of a virus in and around Wuhan at the end of 2019, at the beginning of 2020. That's, I mean, it's, it's just a fact, right? You can debate many things, but we do know that. We also know that at some points, as that outbreak happened, various people tried to silence various medical teams who were responding to it. Again, I'm not I'm not seeking to blame anybody. I'm simply observing just pure facts. We know this because various messages went out, which were then removed. We know this because various people uh, were forced to recant in that sort of Stalinist kind of show trial way. And the third thing we know is that the disease then spread, the same disease then spread around the world and had global implications. Now, 
none of that tells us where it came from. None of that tells us who is responsible. None of that tells us uh, that there is a single cause. But all of those three facts point to a need for openness because I don't know whether the connection to the lab in Wuhan is provable. There are certainly indications that it might be. I don't know whether we're looking at a repeat of the SARS viruses that emerged from uh, the, the wet markets, the so-called wet markets of various places. I, I don't know. But what we do know is that there is an origin, there is a cover-up, and there is a spread. And all of those three are concerning and require investigation. And by the way, not just as James has put it, as David has put it, not just for you know, the interests of the rest of us, but in the interests of the people of China as well. I mean, there's 1.4 billion people who were put at risk first, way before any Australian, American or Brit was, uh, was a danger. So those are the three things we know, and I think they point very, very clearly to the need for an investigation. Thank you. Um, uh, Senator Patterson. What I'd add to Tom's observations is there are th some things that we know that didn't happen. We can say with very great degree of confidence that it was not imported to Wuhan in China via some kind of cold chain food import. We can say with fairly high degree of confidence it did not originate in the United States uh, or that it was not transported to the United States uh, by a US Marine. We can say with great level of confidence that it didn't originate in Italy or Spain or France or Germany or any of the other places that the Chinese government at different times has tried to suggest was the true origin uh, of the virus. We can say with a great deal of confidence that it did originate in Wuhan because that was the area in which it had the earliest and largest and most significant spread and it is from there it appeared to emanate out to the rest of the world. But I would take a step back and acknowledge, yes, it is a scientifically difficult task to identify the source of a new virus. It is not uncommon for it to take some time to identify the true and original source of viruses like these. However, it's made much harder when you have a area in which it has emanated from that is governed by an authoritarian regime that is allergic to scrutiny and openness and transparency and obstructs the scientific effort to get to the bottom of that. And the remarkable thing about where we are today, nearly two years on from the escape of this virus, is how little that we know. Uh, there is no question that is more important to the world today than where and how this got out and how we can prevent it again. It's cost at least 4 million lives, but probably up to 12 million lives. It has uh, created the global economy. It has destroyed international travel. It has locked citizens in their homes, in their tens of millions of hundreds of millions all around the world. Uh, so it, we should know much more than we know today. And the fact that we don't, uh, the, the largest amount of responsibility for that is borne by the Chinese Communist Party. Thank you. David. I can't think we could be better said by our two honest, uh, honorable guests and extremely honest and straightforward uh, thinking the, the distinguished guests because the uh, situation is, uh, is, is, is puzzling, certainly as someone who's worked in, in and around China for 35 years. I uh, never seen anything like this. Even Tiananmen wasn't really a degree of cover up. I mean, when I visited Tiananmen about two and a half months, I think after the incident, the uh, disaster, massacre frankly there was still blood caked on the on the, on the uh, stones in the square they couldn't remove it they were like trying to scrape it out it soaked into it so obviously it was a tremendously bloody massacre i mean this is a bloody massacre on a scale that is like atomic i mean we're getting into weapons of mass destruction level massacre and it doesn't mean it was uh, consciously perpetrated by the chinese that they wanted to uh, bring nightfall upon us and our civilization and globalization. But the impact has been uh, affinitive with that outcome. And we have hard, we have a hard time as a state society and global commons to reconcile ourselves to what's happened. It's just like we, just, we, we, we can't believe it. It's not a Holocaust denial situation. It's just a denial situation that something like this could actually happen and it might have sometime, which he most definitely did in terms of the three things. The Chinese covered it up, we know that. Why they covered it up, that's the question. It's not a question of what they did. Um, this thing was extremely, uh, it was a fresh virus, as Senator Michael mentions. Uh, excuse me, you had a very high uh, uh, ability to spread into a population. It was just highly optimized to spread. And our scientists told us around 99.5%, and they do that based on genetic mapping of previous viruses 
There's never been something that's spread with actually so few mutations early on. I was in China during SARS and uh, it was mutating like every week. I mean, it was, it was sort of ridiculous. Um, and then we, we don't know why the Chinese hadn't and haven't searched extensively. During SARS, I recall very vividly the, the Chinese government, as much as they wanted to cover it up, they were looking like crazy for where this was com coming from. They didn't know. This time, they were prompt to blame a wet market. Well, they knew it wasn't a wet market. Well, then they were prompt to blame like Fort Detrick, U.S. Army Biological Command, which is almost shut down. It really doesn't function anymore in a particularly way. We picked away where we have a, a certain no bio warfare has existed since 1969. And, and then, you know, lastly, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, have had, uh, uh, they've, they've had a very successful time dealing with this. It's hard to understand what they knew that made them know so much about what they were dealing with, that they could deal with it so effectively. It, as much as you would say it's draconian and, and that's the way China is. China is not always effectively draconian. They try to be, <laughs> they try to be a surveillance state, but this is, I've never seen the Chinese act so efficiently. And frankly, when SARS happened and MERS happened, these previous this, the outbreaks of pandemics, it was the Chinese the CDC, their Center for Disease Control, Ministry of Public Health and Welfare, it wasn't the PLA. I mean, why is the PLA in charge of this thing? And frankly, uh, to, to, to follow on a point made earlier, the Chinese people are puzzled by this. They're disturbed. They've never seen the PLA out in the streets like this doing stuff. It's not just in Wuhan. I mean, they were in Shanghai, I know as well, at some of the major hospitals taking over. What, what were they scared of? They didn't want people to sequence the virus. I mean, I know that from uh, people I know personally who are doctors in, 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 around China, and they were told, don't you sequence this is the national security issue. What's the national security issue? So I apologize for going over time. Well, let me let me uh, as that as a jumping off point from uh, your comments, David. Let me, let me ask um, uh, maybe our guest first. Um, um, you've dealt with the inquiry from your governments. You've thought about the uh, uh, the, the the unique problems this poses in terms of information that uh, uh, were was difficult to get from uh, from from communist China. Um, how do we find out what happened and, and is there um, um, uh, a path for some kind of accountability here? Or is this a matter of um, uh, uh, the, the Chinese communist leadership have managed to kind of hamstring the world uh, and, and obscure the, um, the, the, the basic issues underneath this uh, pandemic so that um, accountability is, uh, is unlikely to actually be uh, a factor in the future. Um, um, uh, Senator Patterson? It's a measure of how serious the cover-up has been that even the World Health Organization has said that they are unsatisfied with the conduct of the first phase investigation and that they have proposed a second phase investigation, which they hope will have a better chance of getting to the bottom of it. Although at this stage, I'm not at all optimistic that the second phase investigation will have the access that it needs to conduct that investigation. Um, if it doesn't have access to uh, the Wuhan Institute of Virology and other uh, centres in Wuhan, if it doesn't have access to the data sets that the Chinese government should have access to and should be able to make uh, available, if it doesn't have an ability for them to visit uh, the region and take samples and conduct interviews unobstructed, then I think it is going to be very difficult indeed for that second phase investigation to give us the answers that we all want. And unfortunately, I think if that second phase investigation isn't allowed to be conducted in an unobstructed way, then the world will have to draw conclusions from that about what the Chinese Communist Party is seeking to do in preventing that investigation from occurring. Look, I think James is absolutely right. And this investigation, let's be frank, doesn't have to be conducted by a US, Australian or British scientist. There are many scientists that we trust around the world. Uh, there are many, if you'll excuse the expression, neutral countries, uh, at least from a Chinese perspective. But what I mean by that is trustworthy countries who we could work with very happily, uh, who we could ask to conduct such an investigation. So this isn't, you know, let's be clear, this isn't some form of fidelity test that we're imposing on uh, China to in any way abase itself towards the United States or Australia or Britain, that's absolutely not the case, uh, would be very happy to enter a conversation, find some neutral scientists uh, and just simply conduct that investigation. Now, I think James's point is absolutely uh, 
key, which is, you know, even the World Health Organization, which frankly, for various reasons, hasn't always had um, the strongest line against uh, some of the world's biggest countries, uh, is saying that this is not an acceptable research uh, inquiry that we've seen to date, then frankly, you know, it's a, it's a long way below that. So I think what we need to see now is we need to see the international community as a whole saying, look, help us pick a scientist or rather a team of scientists, pick a team from around the world, pick a, you know, multidisciplinary uh, group from countries that you trust. Uh, there are many, many highly educated and brilliant scientists from around the world. Let's get them in and let's find out what happened. David? Well, unfortunately, uh, my assessment uh, is that we're not going to get access. But on the other side of the coin, I think if we can collect data among ourselves as allies, we have tremendous insight. Australia, of course, has the most advanced animal research laboratory maybe in the world. Uh, there's a very famous Chinese scientist uh, who's uh, involved there. Uh, I don't doubt his motivations as a scientist, uh, but he is in close proximity to the uh, uh, Wuhan Institute of Virology, specifically the coronavirus research of Dr. Shi Jing Li, the, the, the so-called bad lady. Um, in the United States, we have a thing called Eagle Health Alliance. Eagle Health Alliance has been collecting data for the U.S. government and other governments for uh, nearly two decades. Uh, they have a tremendous repository of information. No one has questioned them seriously. They haven't responded to uh, legislative inquiries. Uh, I don't know if they've even responded to subpoenas from law enforcement that they've been dropped. We don't know that because of those things, those proceedings are kept in a, a, a semi-classified way. But I do know this, they receive 98% of their funding from the United States government and they darn well better start coughing up information. Their job was to collect information on dangerous, uh, dangerous coronaviruses around the world. And they funded uh, a disproportionate amount of activity at the Wuhan Virology. And finally, our own, my own government uh, that, that I was part of, uh, and John as well as the cabinet secretary. Uh, this is, uh, we, we know in our health and human services secretariat and our national health, a tremendous amount. We haven't uh, been able to access from the intelligence community our own data because it's not, uh, it's US, so called US persons and protected by privacy. Well, we've had an act of whether it's bioterrorism, which I'm not going to characterize it, or just a bio disaster. Um, we've had an act perpetrated upon us by nature, by God, or by the People's Republic of China and its communist government because of its insecurities and fear of. Uh, not covering something up on its 100th anniversary that involved a basic tragedy, a, a massive accident. Um, we, 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 don't, we can't make excuses for this. This is, you know, Pearl Harbor, you know, doesn't just get attacked and no one looks at it. We don't have a, a violent disaster like 9-11 and, and it doesn't get looked into. I, I, we, we, it's Hudson that strongly favor a national level commission and it must involve our allies beginning with uh, Great Britain and Australia uh, in absolute lockstep. So we welcome the opportunity. Uh, I, uh, I, I could say as a former official uh, uh, who and feels confident that we'll continue as, as, as allies and partners and friends. And we're not out to single out the Chinese for being bad people. This is not about Chinese people. This is just about a paranoid government that we know is an unstable foundation. Uh, and uh, we need to figure out what motivated them to do something this colossal and what that means for the future as we look toward our national international security. Sorry. I'd like to ask a question about the future. I mean, I think our discussion reflects the uh, uh, experience of having uh, a kind of dual institutional failure uh, uh, as a category. One is the, uh, the, the failure to uh, identify quickly and contain this terrible pathogen causing this mass destruction. So the uh, whatever um, uh, possibilities for surveillance, uh, response, uh, corrective action um, has to at least be said to be unsatisfactory. And the second is the part we've been talking about, which is the ability to um, go back and have a, a, a full inquiry for the purposes of um, 
both um, uh, learning and, and preventing and, and where there may be uh, a failure fixing it or, or, or holding people accountable. Um, so um, what do we need to do going forward? How do we prevent this from happening with a different pathogen tomorrow or the year after? Um, um, we've talked about the World Health Organization. We've talked about government responses in various places. Um, okay, what do we learn and what can we do to, uh, uh, to, to uh, be better prepared on both the uh, prevention surveillance side and the investigative side in the future, given what we've seen? Uh, Senator Patterson? One of the things I think we have to look at uh, in the very near future is reform of these multilateral institutions. Uh, the World Health Organization is one among many that uh, sadly um, has not performed anywhere near as effectively as we would have liked it to uh, during this crisis and then lead up into this crisis. And it's going to require uh, all of our countries to roll up our sleeves and get involved and champion that reform to make sure that these organisations function. Because unfortunately, I think if we are not involved, if we are not on the field, it will be taken over by others and they will continue to have a degree of international legitimacy, but none of that international effectiveness that we want it to have. And I think we have to think about whether as a global community, we want to set some standards that countries have to meet before they are allowed to be members of organisations like these, uh, principles that they have to accede to, to sign up to, to in order to be members. Uh, because China and many other countries in the world uh, enjoy the influence and the prestige that it comes from being members of these organisations. And there should be a degree of reciprocity there. There should be a level of expectation about what they contribute to those organisations, including that if ever there is a pandemic like this, which originates in their territory, that they have, they be open and transparent. And then we have to find a way to hold them to those commitments. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Mr. Trugat? Sure, look, I think there's a lot of work to be done. But I think the essential thing to focus on is we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater you know we've, we've got to make sure that we build on the structures that we've got and those are some of the un type structures like the who that bring people in and i think james is absolutely right that holding people to account is important but also i think one of the things we've got to think quite hard about is empowering uh, some of these organizations and taking them more seriously ourselves so i would like to see uh, something like an increase in uh, the independent capability of the who for its uh, inquiries uh, so that when uh, things are reported in, it can actually immediately launch its own inquiries without having to look around for a, the latest round of fundraising in order to in order to support it. Because it's certainly in those early days when uh, cover-ups are being attempted, or indeed when uh, outbreaks are starting, that you can have the most effect, both on suppressing the outbreak and, and, and having the medical effect, but also in uh, making sure you're collecting the data so that uh, cover-ups aren't successful. So I think uh, looking at how we support uh, organizations like WHO so they actually have an independent capability, uh, I think is an important area we need to look at. I think it would protect us all and uh, make sure that the rules-based system, as we somewhat euphemistically call it, uh, actually works for all of us. David? Well, you know, I had a cynical relationship with the IEAEA, which uh, is involved in uh, overseeing non-proliferation matters for governments uh, related to nuclear proliferation. And, uh, you know, it, it evolved over time in a very positive direction. We empowered them as an investigative arm. We started to provide them with the strategic level intelligence, not just tactical information and sort of occasional briefings. Uh, we, we trusted them. We know that the information can get to the other sides, but it's sometimes worth letting your adversary or your ally know what you know. There is a transparency. Um, we see that with the Chemical and Biological Weapons Convention occasionally, unfortunately not uh, <laughs> sufficiently, it's certainly with the BWC, the Biological Weapons Convention, but we could make it better. And we certainly can make the WHO better. We, we've let the WHO uh, sort of die on the vine as the United States government, as far as I'm concerned. And we've let the Chinese essentially take it over at, at a certain level because they care. They see it as an opportunity. It's, it, it, you know, it was created by all of us, not just the United States, all of us as partners uh, and allies. And we can darn well uh, use our budget power and our knowledge and the credibility of, of Tedros, who I don't think is a bad fellow at all, who's the leader, who who's, who's believes the investigation is correct. Dr. was unacceptable. 
I don't want to deny the importance of international institutions in these things. I don't want to give up the United Nations, the Chinese. I don't want to give up the WHO. I'm just a scholar. You are leaders of your respective legislative bodies uh, and parliamentary bodies. Uh, so I'll defer to you. But to me, you know, I don't have a vote uh, other than my, my one vote at the election on the electoral uh, ballot box. But I think that uh, your insight is correct. Uh, and I defer to your uh, leadership on how to fix these organizations. I want to ask about what if good citizenship is not an option here? I mean, in a certain way, the reforms and the inquiries you're talking about um, kind of depend on, or I think they do depend on, the goodwill or the ultimately kind of moving uh, countries or actors into a category of standards of behavior that would be uh, conducive for um, inquiry, uh, cooperation, uh, uh, joining against a common danger. Um, um, one, I think what you've already talked about us knowing in terms of a cover-up um, suggests that's not reliable, um, at least in this, perhaps in this case, and maybe in other cases, that whether for malicious reasons of self-interest uh, or just um, uh, um, bureaucratic uh, 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 misbehavior um, um, that uh, obscuring um, culpability or expecting the, the wrongdoer to be open and confess um, is, um, is not an adequate standard that sometimes we will look at this as a common accident or, or, or malady, but sometimes uh, uh, that's not the case and it threatens the leadership uh, and, and it threatens uh, institutional, institutional uh, futures. Um, do we need a form of this that is less dependent on cooperation? Do we need a form of this that um, uh, um, can handle um, a malicious activity? I mean, there's been a lot of discussion, I think, in most of our countries about how the danger and damage of the pandemic can encourage malicious actors, even non-state actors, to use things like synthetic biology as a weapon. We've been worried about this in, in terms of terrorist attacks, but now we see the massively devastating effect of something like this. So do you think we need structures proceeding with the international uh, bodies and strengthening them, but do you think we need structures uh, among our countries or among some, uh, I guess the old phrase is the coalition of the willing, to? Um, to be a little bit uh, more capable of responding to um, uh, malicious activity or activity that is not able to be put into the realm of, of cooperation. Um, um, Mr. Tukenhat? Sure, look, I, I think that there's a lot of work to be done here. I mean, I would still start off with reform of this, if you, if you like, the civilian institutions, the WHOs of this world, because you know the first line of defense of any community is not uh, you know, it, it is not the, the, the special forces team, it's, it's the policeman walking his beat. Uh, and I think that, you know, maintaining uh, ground truth, ground awareness, just general pattern of life, if you like, through cooperation on public health is still the basic protection for all of us. But you're absolutely right. You know, we have seen uh, in the UK, we've seen uh, the use of chemical and, bio uh, chemical and nuclear weapons used in uh, on our streets, actually, in this case, by Russia using polonium, a nuclear substance to poison uh, Mr. Litvinenko. And we've seen um, the use of Novichok, which, as you know, is a vicious chemical weapon used in Salisbury. So we see different forms of non-traditional warfare, even, even in a peaceful place like the UK. So the possibility of biohazards being used is, is certainly not zero. Uh, and I know that the cooperation between Port and Down and uh, its Australian and, and US equivalents is extremely close, uh, as is indeed the cooperation in NATO. But this is where I think that, you know, looking at organizations like the OPCW, the Office for the Prevention of Chemical Weapons, you know, is absolutely essential because that organization, okay, I mean, it's, it's specifically focused on chemical weapons, but it also uh, has, uh, you know, we, we also need, and we also do have some sister organizations that work on biological weapons and so on. Because looking at um, that wider protection is, is important in awareness terms. The response, I would argue, uh, then comes down to the usual channels, I'm afraid, uh, by which I mean uh, the Five Eyes Alliance, the NATO Alliance, and indeed other partnerships and alliances that we have with countries around the world. 
Okay, Mr. Patterson. The only thing I'd add to what Tom said is that all governments in the, in the world, as long as they're functional, competent and rational, respond to incentives. Uh, we are not dealing here with a failed state or an ungoverned space. We are dealing with a government which has interests, which it seeks to promote in the world. And if those interests are impacted negatively sufficiently, it will induce a change in behaviour. Every government responds to that kind of pressure, whether they're authoritarian or democratic. And so if we have the incentives in place that encourage good behaviour, even without goodwill, you should be able to encourage good behaviour. And it is up to all of us to, to impose those incentives, to provide those incentives. And I think already uh, the Chinese government is understanding the consequences of its behaviour over the last two years. It has suffered a very significant loss of international standing. It has suffered a very serious hit to its soft power. Its diplomatic relationships are strained with almost all of its international partners. And although it might take some time for that to induce change in the Chinese political system, you know, I think it only is a matter of time before uh, those incentives, uh, those signals become clear and a change of path will have to occur. Okay. David? Oh, I had a relatively unique experience of leading an effort to actually impose uh, financial and economic costs on, on China, as well as North Korea as the leader of the North Korean Illicit Activities Initiative, which targeted uh, a very small bank in Macau directly called Banco Delta Asia. But it was a Chinese bank. It, it, it was less than a billion dollar uh, bank in terms of deposits. In fact, probably more like 300 million. Uh, but it had a, it was a, as a, as a flow through point for North Korea into the world system, uh, including North Korean nuclear proliferation finance, uh, counterfeit uh, 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 currency, uh, uh, drugs, uh, including the drugs that made their way on the Pong Sua ship to Australia that I helped uh, the Australian government in 2003. It was just like this bad bank right out of a movie, yeah, sort of a bad movie. Um, that strategy was not just designed to impact North Korea, it was designed to impact China. Um, we cut that little bank off the international system via our USA Patriot Act. Uh, uh, and uh, we just said, you can't clear dollars in the US. And then we told the Bank of China and other banks in China, very large banks, that if they wanted to be next, they could keep clearing transactions to the North Korean government. And they said, no way. Um, and the Chinese government went from Stone cold, stone cold uh, responses to us to saying, "What do I do to help? What do we do to help?" I mean, my experience with Chinese is not that uh, you know co coercion is not a nice thing, but they coerce us, so we might want to try to coerce them in return, and they might actually respect us more. Coercion in this situation is really not coercion; it's law enforcement. Our we've been violated by Chinese inaction over the spread of a potential pandemic they were aware of for two to three months minimum. They cover that up. Why they covered it up is more important than where this came out of the lab. As much as I care about that as an arms control investigator. To me, the cover up is, as they've already said, is worse than the crime. We need to impose costs on them. They need to be reasonable costs. There needs to be an outcome that can be negotiated, but there need to be costs and they need to be swift and need to be strong, but they have to be based on evidence. That's why our governments need to get together uh, as uh, uh, law enforcing law abiding states to try to uh, collect that evidence. It's not necessarily intelligence. It's the intelligence that exists between your two ears, okay? It's not secret intelligence of some source. We didn't have so many of these sources. We have, well, we certainly know what happened here. I mean, we've had millions of people die. So let's start with that fact and let's go backward and say, how did they die? And why did the Chinese not give us an alert that there was a pandemic spreading in their country and that they unleashed uh, knowingly or unknowingly on the world? Uh, but they did it uh, uh, in a way that had some malicious outcome. Uh, and, and that malicious outcome is, is, is a problem for the future. I want to, before we conclude, uh, I, I want to ask about uh, another aspect of the origins of this. Um, we have had debates in the United States. I'm less familiar with all the debates that may be going on in the United Kingdom and in Australia, but um, uh, about the uh, nature of the research that was prompt, that may have been being conducted here, so-called gain-of-function research, taking pathogens and 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 enhancing their danger. For, now, 
on, 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 on the beneficial uh, interpretation, you could say, in order to prepare us for uh, uh, preventing them in the future should they evolve uh, in, in the environment. But uh, uh, there has been, as you no doubt know, controversy in the United States that's still ongoing about the United States institutions involvement in this research that even uh, um, if not intentionally um, uh, released or without the culpability of the Chinese was, was a, um, was a uh, danger and a danger that was not properly supervised. That, and this, given the fact that these are certainly obviously capable of being global, do you think that uh, we need a, a, a better system of scrutinizing um, dangerous research in the, in, in the biological realm? And do you think it's possible to create such a system? Uh, um, Senator Patterson? John, uh, gain-of-function research is a fine idea in theory, but if it's to happen in practice, it can only happen under conditions that have the most robust safeguards, the most careful checks and balances, uh, robust transparency, and without those things, you cannot have confidence that they are being conducted in a safe way and in a way that's to the benefit of mankind and not to its detriment. And we do know that the Wuhan Institute of Virology does have a patchy safety record, that there were concerns within the US government and other governments about that safety record. And no lab that doesn't have a very strong safety record should be engaging in what is uh, highly risky, uh, potentially calamitous research. And so the question is, what can we do as an international community to regulate that? Well, it's very difficult. If a sovereign country within its borders wants to engage in risky research uh, and doesn't want to be open and transparent about that with the world, there is not a great deal that we can do to prevent them from doing that. But they should remember when they're doing so that the first uh, victims of any failure are likely to be their own citizens before it is anyone else. And that's the great tragedy of what uh, happened here. Uh, most likely, uh, potentially, in Wuhan, is that it was the Chinese people that suffered, at least from the mishandling uh, of what might have been a natural origin, but even worse, uh, the mishandling of an accidental uh, lab leak. Uh, Mr. Tuchenhan. I agree with James. I'm afraid the reality is that sovereign countries, particularly powerful ones like China, if they wish to hide things, they can hide things, and there's not an awful lot we can do about it. But I do think that there is an awful lot of work that we can do uh, in making sure that those countries that wish to cooperate on general norms and wish to uh, have uh, their principles and their, and their science validated and therefore able to be got into commercial routes uh, need to have structures in which we can verify those routes. You know, we see this with the development of uh, biomedical sciences uh, and the different ways in which our companies invest, yes, in countries like China and invest around the world. Uh, and we should be making sure that, you know, with that investment comes responsibility and comes accountability. Um, I think what I'm waiting for out of, uh, out of the uh, reports that we're, I hope, going to get one day out of Wuhan is going to be uh, some real indication as to whether or not there was a connection between uh, the laboratory and the virus, whether or not the gain of function uh, research in any way supported any of the, the um, spread of this virus. And on that, I'm, you know, I'm looking forward to various reports that, that we're expecting in coming weeks. David? The thing I learned out of this experience, uh, and I had been to the Wuhan Institute in 1997 or 98, it wasn't because we didn't suspect some activity going on there. So we've forgotten more than we've ever learned, I find, in, in our governments. Uh, and one of the things we did at State Department was go through 40 years of cables, including many cables that were unclassified because they're scientific related uh, they had suspicions about what was going on in Wuhan. They go back a long way. And it wasn't just at the Wuhan Institute. There's a network of uh, research institutions uh, across China that are tied into it. It's the premier institution. But the, the key thing is this. We shouldn't have been giving it material support. I'm saying the U.S. government. I'm not going to assign blame to anybody else. I blame us, uh, not for causing this, but I blame us for being stupid enough to be entrapped in a conspiracy perpetrated by the Chinese intelligence uh, and national, uh, uh, you know, Communist Party to essentially make us uh, lose attention to the fact that we're transferring material, scientific knowledge, technology, and te specific technology uh, to a program that had a dual use orientation. And the fact is, these dual use research concern programs, they call them jerk in the scientific community, 
they're everywhere. Almost every major country in the world could create a biological weapon. This is what we learned from this. What we learned in China is they made a particular strong effort to do this. I did not realize, even though I had been involved uh, in looking at this uh, 25 years ago, how far they had come. It's amazing how much the Chinese have made an effort to, to develop uh, uh, biological uh, dual use capabilities. Uh, and dual use capabilities mean it's either offense or defense, largely by, by how you uh, uh, conduct yourself after its release. If it was an accident, they should have called and said, we had an accident. We're gonna clean this thing up. I think we could have done that actually. Um, that, that wouldn't have been an inexcusable offense. Instead, we had zero communication for months and months, which actually continues pretty much to this day related to, to, to COVID-19, uh, which is not guilt but it, uh, 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 by creation, but it's guilt by association and trying to perpetrate a cover-up. So what do we do? We need export controls on dual-use biotechnology. We have none, literally. And I'm saying United States. I'm not going to speak for other governments. These uh, esteemed representatives can speak for their own governments. We have nothing. Okay, this is not a, nobody understands the power of biotechnology in the context of causing global harm. It has tremendous potential and current uh, evidence for causing global good. Okay, but there's a dual, there's a dual side to this, okay, two sides to the point. We don't have any sort of vigilant uh, oversight over our own laboratories. What if some crazy person was to cook this up at one of our major drug companies? And I say ours because all of the companies that we share in, in the pharmaceutical space are mostly international and collaborative among our, all, all, all three of our countries. So, I mean, the NIH doesn't even have an inspector general in the United States, okay? It's one of the largest grant uh, making bodies in the world, maybe the largest, other than the Chinese. And no one even knows what's going on there. They have no oversight in terms of counterintelligence. They don't know if they're being penetrated. I hope that our, our, our deeply respected colleagues uh, allies in Australia and, and the United Kingdom have this capability, but we don't have it. We're, we're basically running uh, sort of, you know, free as if this stuff is not dangerous. This virus, however it arrived on the face of the earth, has shown the danger and it's revealed that the Chinese have an extensive program to do research into this. So I just say that they, they declared it in 2011 to the Biological Weapons Convention that Synthetic biology was uh, uh, proposed uh, a bright future of humanity if used properly and a dark future if used improperly. And so far, I've seen very little evidence out of China that it's been used properly. You know, I mean, they create, uh, co they, it's not just COVID-19, whether it was created or not. We know they're using CRISPR to, to create superhuman soldiers and fetuses that are, you know, have like six heads when they're born. I mean, this there's a bit of a wild west going on in China. It's totally unregulated and unfortunately shouldn't be aided and abetted by our governments. Apologize for the link. Um, before we leave, I, I want to ask, um, uh, so, uh, you know, um, Hudson Institute's founder, Herman Kahn, was, was, was uh, uh, dedicated to partly thinking about policy problems by thinking about where things might be and where they could be in the future. And uh, I know, uh, for example, uh, uh, Senator Patterson, there's going to be a meeting of the Quad at the later part of the month. I wonder how much uh, this might be discussed and what might happen. But I'd, I'd like to ask all of you as a kind of closing question. Um, um, five years from now, how do you think uh, uh, this situation will, will look? Uh, what will we have uh, uh, done? Uh, what, will, what will change? What will... Um, um, what, what will what will be uh, uh, either safer or more dangerous in the in in the in the future five years ahead, um, Senator Patterson? John, uh, for Australia, outside the Five Eyes intelligence sharing relationship, the Quad is our most exciting and uh, most important emerging new security partnership, and it brings together four of the great democracies of the Pacific and with increasingly aligned values and interests. And I hope that it can exert a significant positive influence on the Indo-Pacific in those five to 10 years ahead and encourage uh, all countries in the region to understand why they benefit from the free and open rules-based order that we've all prospered from uh, since World War II that have enriched all of our peoples uh, and has provided remarkable peace and stability in our region since then. Um, what, I, what do I hope that comes out of the next five to 10 years? Uh, two things. One, that we uh, set as an expectation for all 
nations which wish to be taken seriously on the global stage, that if these events are ever replicated in their own countries, that they will behave in a way that is transparent, that is open, uh, that allows appropriate scrutiny on a scientific basis. And secondly, that if knowing that we won't necessarily be able to guarantee that first thing, that each of our countries do the work now that needs to be done to make sure that if and when, sadly, this probably happens again, that we are all better prepared to protect our people from that harm. Protect them both in terms of their health, but also in terms of their freedom and their prosperity. Because in many countries, we have rested very heavily on quite draconian restrictions on the liberties of individual citizens, their ability to travel, their ability to work, their ability to socialise with their family and friends. And I hope we never see again those very harsh emergency measures that were unfortunately had to be put in place in almost all of our countries in response to this crisis, because it really did catch most of us by surprise. Excellent point. Um, Mr. Tugendhat. Well, look, I think James is absolutely right. And I think looking forward, the, the, the fundamental uh, change that I'd hope we'd see in uh, five years' time is that our countries create the core of a new way of uh, standing up for our own people and identifying the threats that we face. Now, I hope that that also builds into the internationalism that I spoke about with the World Health Organization. And, but I think that the, the, the fundamental thing that is, is likely to happen is an increased awareness uh, of dependency, because it, this isn't just dependency in the sense of uh, we've all demonstrated the globalization of health threats, but we've also demonstrated the globalization of a dependency on personal protective equipment from single manufacturers. We've also demonstrated the uh, dependency that many countries have felt on uh, drugs manufactured in single states. So I hope what we're going to see is uh, over the next five years, a shift away from simple just in time, cheap, cheapest possible uh, manufacturing, to realizing that actually resilience is also uh, a cost factor and that failure to have resilience may uh, achieve an immediate saving, but may inject a long-term risk. And so actually what I'd like to see is I'd like to see greater dependence on each other's markets, recognizing that, you know, that you, you know, the, the one people you can absolutely trust are the five eyes, and NATO partners, and then working out from there, uh, so that you you do not find yourself, or well, none of us find ourselves entirely dependent on a country who, at a moment of maximum vulnerability, exploits the protection of our health workers and our res first responders for political and uh, uh, and geopolitical gain. Can I just ask you? So what you're saying is is less the discussion that we've had to some degree in the United States, and I'm sure in other countries too, of well, let's let's fortify within our own country all the potential uh, needs and threats and so forth. You're, you're suggesting that this, the, the need to have redundancy and, and greater strength can be part of the, an alliance structure absolutely. of reliable allies. Now, absolutely, and not only can be, should be, because if you're a country like uh, the United Kingdom or Australia, where you know, we don't have the population of the United States and geographically we're much smaller. I mean, obviously Australia is rather large, but its population density is, uh, is such that actually various elements are rather more constrained in certain areas. Or if you're a partner like uh, Singapore or indeed um, Denmark, where you simply can't have that depth of manufacturing capability or geographic spread, then actually resilience isn't just what you do at home, it's what you do with partners and allies and that's just as true in defense terms, military defense terms, it is in, true in medical defense, or indeed, um, perhaps a relevant topic for today, or for rather for a future discussion, semiconductors and other forms of technology. You know, we are intertwined in our defense capabilities, in our economic defense, in our, in our health defense, just as we are through NATO or any other alliance. And I think we need to look at what are the sovereign capabilities for the UK, you know, one of those is the nuclear deterrent, for example, which is a personal sovereign capability. But we don't rely solely on ourselves for the defense of the United Kingdom. We rely on our friends and allies, despite the fact we know we need to have our unique sovereign capability. That accounts for the, for the ultimate element, if you like. In health terms, maybe that's 10, 20, 30 percent of your PPE manufacturing. Maybe 50 percent of the rest is made by allies and maybe the last 20 percent is made by countries where, you know what, it's cheap. So, you know, there's ways of looking at resilience in a different in, in different contexts, and I hope that we use the next five years to look at that seriously. Yeah, I think that's a very important topic and something that could 
cause a way of rethinking things like NATO, the Quad, other kinds of alliance structures in a in a more uh, 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 in a more up to date and current way in terms of the threats. Uh, David, where do you think we're going to be in five years? I just think first it's it's with great gratitude that we hear from uh, you know the leader of the uh, Great Britain's uh, former Commonwealth uh, Affairs uh, uh, Committee and uh, Senator who oversees uh, intelligence and national security in Australia our two closest uh, allies uh, uh, over the long haul and we are you know we are in this together that's I think the key message. We need to create a biodefensive alliance structure. It can't just be about uh, the nuclear and chemical. And these are, the nuclear weapons are, I hate to say, in some ways outdated in my mind as a scholar. You guys are at the front lines of protecting your countries and overseeing their, your, your, you know, your, your executive branches. I'm not, I'm just a bureaucrat turned scholar. But I do think that uh, we need to create a, a network of new understanding these biological threats, however they may emanate, are eminently uh, possible to be propagated with, uh, the, through nature and the globalized system we live in, but also through just high technology, lack of transparency, and adverse intentions. And as we think toward the unthinkable, we need to realize whether this is a wake-up call about the threat of a biological war in the future, um, it better be one. Okay, I mean, some people haven't woken up to it. It, it. The technology exists. It may not have been employed specifically in this case. I suspect it was not deliberately, but indeliberately. They just screwed up. But a huge screw up, as we learned in the famous movie, Dr. Strange, Strangelove, involving some aberrant individual, can cause a global disaster. We can't afford it. We have way too much good things, way too many good things to happen in the future for our people and for our nations in unity. This is ridiculous. And China and its uh, intentions cannot be allowed to dominate our democracy and capitalist system that we share together among ourselves and the whole world. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, uh, uh, Senator Patterson. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Tugendhat. I, I appreciate the discussion and I appreciate the the issue at the end uh, that I think uh, is important for us to kind of think about as a as a, as a way of thinking about the alliance structure and the threats we commonly perceive in the future. You've been very generous with your time. Uh, thank you for your services to your country and for our common interest. Uh, uh, I look forward to talking to you again. So long. Thank you. Thank you.